So my name is Harry Rock, and welcome to Westfield's old burying ground from 1669, when our fair city, a town at the time, was established. And this being the eighth Westfield historic ghost tours. The old burying ground is one of the oldest cemeteries and graveyards in the United States still residing in its original location. Here you will find the names and the resting place of the original settlers of our community, including names that you will see on the street posts around town. Fowler, Noble, Dewey, Shepherd, Valley, Taylor, Sackett, Ashley, Ingersoll, and more. Tonight, you will hear the stories of these brave souls who chose this westernmost town of the Commonwealth at the time to become their home. As you move from grave to grave, please stay close to your tour guide as marker stones have a habit of jumping in front of you. <laughs> and they are very unforgiving. Also, please listen carefully as the voices of our ghosts are very old and frail and sometimes can be difficult to hear. These tours are sponsored by the Westfield Historic Commission and all the funds raised tonight, thank you very much, go directly back into the restoration and preservation of this beautiful cemetery. The Historical Commission's mission is to preserve Westfield's history. They also work in the other burying grounds in Westfield and are working toward putting the Westfield Canal on the list of National Historic Places. Each year the Commission presents the Preservation Award which recognizes the efforts of a person or business who has helped promote and preserve Westfield's history. The Commission also just installed the interpretive sign that you will soon see that gives more information about this cemetery. And should you choose to want to come back to explore it even more deeply, you can always ask for the key to the gate at the Westfield Afternoon. If you look on the Westfield Historical Commission website, you will find seven virtual tours of places that are important in Westfield's history and an app that was created called Whipping Around Westfield, <laughs> which provides a walking tour of the downtown. Many people are dedicated to preserving Westfield's history, and by being here tonight, so are you. Now come with me to meet your guides, and we will take you back in time over 350 years to Westfield's beginning, 1669. Follow me. Jeremiah, look at the crowd we have. Boy, they must be very brave to be in a cemetery after dark. Wow. My name is, is, is Jeremiah Fowler, and I am an undertaker. Do you know what I do? You have no clue. <laughs> sir, this man will tell you, because he knows us well, I bet. What do we do, sir? Bury people. We bury people, and we bury people in cemeteries just like this. The, the wonderful cemetery that we have here is one of the oldest in the country, and we are really pleased that you are here. But to be here tonight, you have to imagine what it was like back in the days of the wild, wild west. Yes to the 1600s. I'm not talking that Wild West of John Wayne. No, no, no. <laughs> of the 1600s, when men and women, well, the men, had their muskets at hand, always ready. They were out there in the fields working. There were Indians in the neighborhood, and their wives would be at home, tending to their chores, doing everything to keep their families happy. And at night, they would all go into their homes. They would shut the door and hope. This was, there was a fort over here, Fort Meadow. You've probably heard of that, Fort Meadow School? Yes, did anyone go to Fort Meadow School? No, no. And of course, 
you had to be real, oh, there were some here, and you had to be really, really protected because the Indians could attack at any time. They were peaceful and they were wonderful people, but sometimes they would be angry and uh, like uh, they, they probably deserve to be angry. And uh, uh, they, they, the, the folks were really kind of protective about that. Well, at, at any rate, um, there is a constant fear of Indian attack and scalping was, uh, was, you could be taken prisoner or you could be scalped. Is there, oh, this man over here has already been scalped. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry at all. Yes, yes. And uh, at any rate, Westview was the westernmost town in all of Massachusetts Bay. And it remained that way until 1725. It took a lot of courage to, to live here and it takes a lot of courage for you to be with us tonight. This is my companion. Yes, I'm Cynthia Dewey. Very happy to meet you. And in fact, in 1640, a group of fur traders originally settled in this area, building places to, to swap furs with the Indians. Beaver skins were very valuable. In fact, they were used as units of currency. In 1669, a charter was given to 23 very brave young men to start a town here. Some of those settlers included names like Mosley, Sackett, Dewey, Ingersoll, Phelps, Noble, and Root, to name just a few. And we'll actually meet some of them tonight. Yes, and if we are very fortunate, some of those people, well, the more friendly souls buried here, may appear to speak. They'll speak to us. But we promise to do our best to return all of you safely to your cars so you may enjoy Westfield in 20. 21. Yes. So as we begin, we just simply ask you to please stay within the solar lights as we walk. There are many small little stones along the way, and we don't want to lose any of you along our track tonight. And also, if you do have a luminary in your hand, please do not shine it into the eyes of our ghosts. That makes them very cranky, and we don't want cranky ghosts. Oh, no, we don't want cranky ghosts, do we? No. Oh, no, 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 no. no. So before we start, please turn around and look into the cemetery and you'll see blue lights that will light up all of the stones that we'll be visiting tonight. See the lighting up? Okay, please follow us now. We have an incantation, don't we? Yes, in order to get the ghosts to appear, we have an incantation that I'd like to help have you help me to say. I'll say it once and then you can you can follow along, all right? Spirits of Westfield, arise tonight and tell our tale when lit up bright. Now let's all try that together. Spirits of Westfield, arise tonight and tell your tale when lit up bright. Hello, sir. Come right in. Come right in. Do not be afraid. They're friendly. Friendly people. <laughs> I am Cornet Thomas Dewey, and I was born in Windsor, Connecticut in 1648. Cornet was a military term. It was a sign of respect. In 1666, at the age of 26, I took a risk when I went with 13 men to the untamed wilderness called Warren Oak. I was a miller and a farmer, and I held many prestigious positions in town. One of the most important jobs was in 1671, when I was sent to Boston to procure a minister for this untamed land. You will get to meet him later on the tour. Tonight, you will get a brief glimpse into what life was like in Colonial Westfield. These stones tell the stories of our lives and our deaths. Various causes of death were recorded in Westfield, including consumption, smallpox, drowning, epilepsy, died in a snowstorm, killed by Indians, childbirth, yes, falling tree limb, powder mill explosion, gun backfire, house fire, many causes of death, murder, 
Oh yes, there was murder. Sorry for your sensitive ears. <laughs> Even scalded by a skillet of hot milk. Did I mention killed by Indians? This was an untamed land, but we were very resilient. Very resilient. In fact, there are over 50 Jewish buried in this burying ground today. Thank you, sir, for sharing your tale with us. Mr. This... do you have a tale about this that happened very recently? Tell us. Yes, this stone was recently restored. It had become very unsafe, so we are restoring it. And in the process of doing that, um, two young men had come into the graveyard, were asking what we were doing, helped us finish restoring the stone, and then they discovered several weeks later that that is their 11th great-grandfather oh. and had never known. So thank you, sir, for telling your tale. Please follow us this way. All right. I think we'll do everyone one more time, and then we'll break it up a little later in the, in the uh, performance. All right? Mm -hmm. Spirits, Spirits of Westfield, Westfield. Arise tonight and tell your tale when lit up right. I am John Mosley, and I was one of the original men who were given a chance to be part to settle a new area called Warno. It later became named Streamfield for a few years and then eventually Westfield. From the land I acquired, I donated land for the building of the first meeting house or church in 1673. It was located near the fort on the Little River, probably near the bridge. The exact location is undiscoverable due to over time the changing of the river's course. The, the meeting house was 36 feet squared with a pyramid roof and a turret in the center as a watchtower during the Indian Troubles. And you can see a replica at the Stanley Park Field today. I died probably from an epidemic of smallpox, smallpox in 1690. Records indicate that a large portion of the population passed away that year. My family remained a prominent member of Westfield, and in 1914, a school was named after us. Mosley School. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Rest well tonight. I want the women to do this incantation because we are about to meet a very lovely, lovely lady. All right? Spirits of Westfield, rise tonight and tell your tale when lit up right. Well, it'll do. <laughs> I was the wife of James Cornish. He was born about 1634 in Saybrook, Connecticut. He first moved to Northampton in 1662 to become their schoolmaster. But after I died, he applied to be one of the first land grantees in the new settlement of Westfield. He moved here in 1668 and was given four home lots by Little River. He was the school teacher here, as well as the town clerk. Evidently, he had a bit of a temper because in 1671, he was fined 10 shillings for taking the Lord's name in vain in public. He was again fined 20 shillings for cursing. And the court has stated that it was a disgrace that such a man of his quality and profession should dishonor God and give such an evil example to the youth. It is not clear if he remained as schoolmaster, and he died destitute in 1714. His stone has disappeared over time, but his story remains. Now, all together, men, spirit. Wait one second here. <laughs> Could you put something into it? <laughs> Try it again. Spirits Much better. Tonight, tonight, and tell your tale when lit up right. Lit up. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. like, there we are. Good evening. That was that was 
decent gentleman, but you didn't quite impress the ladies. I am Mary. I am Temperance. While we are buried here on these grounds, unfortunately our stones have been lost to time. We stand here before you at this prominent Westfield family to tell our story. The autumn of 1675 into 1676 was a really terrible time for us struggling settlers here in western Massachusetts. You see, this was the time of King Philip's War, which was led by Medicom, or as we call him, King Philip. This war was the last major effort of the Native Americans of southern New England to drive out us English settlers. Well, King Philip, he united the Narragansett, the Comtuck, the Wampanoag, the Nipmuc, and they launched bloody surprise attacks against us. The fighting lasted 14 long months, and 12 frontier towns were destroyed. Westfield and Hadley were lucky compared to others. Only minor destruction here, but the properties of John Cornish, Ambrose Fowler. Who else? There were so many. Moses Lee, and our dear, dear friend, Mr. Cook, perished in the fighting. Rest in peace. Well, Boston, of course knew that this wouldn't end, so they ordered us to go to the nearby forded town of Springfield. Westfield refused that order, and instead built a palisade two miles around. It started at the corner of Main and Meadow, ran north behind our meeting house to the Westfield River, followed the water all the way to the brook across Noble Street, and back to the beginning. This palisade was made from tall trees. They were cut down and cleft in half lengthwise driven into the ground so closely together that it formed a continuous wall eight feet high for two miles. What a monumental task it must have been to cut down enough trees to stretch for two miles. Well, the war ended after Medicom, or King Philip, was finally captured and beheaded. His head was placed upon a pole and prominently displayed in Plymouth as a warning to the consequences if such attacks continued. Some of Philip's supporters fled north to Canada, while others surrendered, but unfortunately were sold into slavery. It would be another 70 plus years until Western Massachusetts could rest easy from such attacks, not until the end of the French and Indian War in 1763. A loaded musket would stand at the ready at every door. Enjoy your evening. <laughs> Mr. Sis, what is the name of the family again on this stone? This is the Bag family. The Bag family! I think I knew their daughter <laughs> shopping and their son, Doggy. <laughs> <laughs> Doggy Bag. <laughs> You're right here. Yes. In our zeal to hurry along, we missed a ghost. So oh my we've invited word. him to come join us to tell us yet another story about Native American attacks. Oh, come right yes. in! Spirit of Westfield arrives tonight. Tell your tale when lit up bright. Jedediah, good to see you. Nice to see you, As Mr. Zucker. As I Zucker. live and breathe, or yes. I don't live and breathe. You don't <laughs> live and breathe, but go <laughs> ahead. It's two years. Uh, yet it has. It has far too long, sir. Just get the flask and sit down. I did. I enjoyed it just before the show oh, tonight. This is just making it Saturday night. Oh, gosh. Oh, oh, you brought some visitors. Yes. Good evening. Yes. Good evening, all. Good evening. My name is John Sackett. And I was born in 1632 in Cambridge, out near Boston. In fact, I was the first infant born in Cambridge. In 1658, I came west to Springfield. And in 1665, I was one of the first three permanent settlers who came to a village known as Warnoco, which in three years would be renamed Westfield because it was the furthest westernmost city, town, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And it was here I established my home in Farmstead, which sadly were destroyed by the Indians. I did rebuild on the road to Glasgow Mountain, which you probably know better as Russell Mountain. My wife, Abigail Hannum, and I, we had eight children. Our youngest, however, Elizabeth, was five years old when she was kidnapped by the Indians. We thought she was left for dead and never saw her again. But 27 years later, <coughs> Abigail returned to Westfield with her Indian husband and children. And they stayed for a short while. They left and we never saw them again. Now the Sackets lived in this area for generations. 
And one of my descendants, Stephen Sackett, built a magnificent tavern that exists to this day on Upper Western Avenue. Perhaps you've seen it. And you all have remembered the Sackett family, not only here at the old burial ground, but with Sackett Street in here in West Virginia. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for not forgetting me in this moment thank of hate. Not at all. And uh, <laughs> may I, we say the phrase that we usually do? Please, sack it to me. <laughs> and we Farewell. Have been, I think we've been very hard on the poor Native Americans, because I think they probably were justified in the attack. Very since, justified. Since we took their land. Yes, they were here first. Yes. It was their land. Follow us this way, please. Children, it is your turn. Are you ready? Let me go over it. I will say it slowly so everybody, you kids? Right. All righty. Spirits of Westfield. Spirits of Westfield. Nice and loud. Spirits of Westfield. Very good. Arise tonight. And tell your tale. When lit up. Right. Very good. My name is Daniel Fowler. And I am the grandson of the original settler, Samuel Fowler. My father built the landlord Fowler Tavern on Main Street in 1755, which I later took over in 1761. For many years, my tavern was used as a resting place for travelers passing through Westfield on their way to Boston. At the start of the American Revolution, my tavern was used as a secret meeting place by patriots. If we were ever discovered, we could have all been faced by truth. We could have all been punished by death. Our Connecticut Valley broken scroll pediment front door is considered one of the finest examples of its time, which is why it was taken in the early 1900s to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. My tavern is listed in the National Registry of Historic Places. But sadly, the replacement door on the front of my tavern was hit by a truck and badly dented. But luckily, the exact replica of the original door was placed on my tavern, my tavern and can be seen to this day. Thank you. Is that a picture of that truck? Yes, this is a picture of the original door on my tavern. And what is Good evening, everyone. I am Thomas Bancroft, and I too am one of the first settlers of this land. In the original charter for Westfield, I was to be given 30 acres and a home lot on the port side, which is an area right over here where Fort Meadow School stands today. In 1707, one of my relatives, an Edward Bancroft, was the only person listed as shot and killed during an Indian attack. He died at just age 18. However, it would be my grandson, Captain John Bancroft, who would earn the family a little bit more dubious fame. You see, Captain John was quite wealthy. He owned many slaves and a beautiful brick mansion on Pachasic Road here in town. His home at 530 Pachasic Road still stands today and is considered to be the second oldest brick home in Western Massachusetts. What you see in front of you is my grandson, Captain John Bancroft's tabletop grave. Sadly, during the Revolutionary War, he was thought to be a loyalist and a British spy and had to leave town for a period of time. Some folks even tried to burn his house down. However, it would be my great-grandson and Captain John's nephew, another Edward Bancroft, who would earn, be more, uh, earn more dubious an honor. You see, during the Revolutionary War, Edward Bancroft was sent to England with both Benjamin Franklin and Silas Dean to spy on the British on behalf of the United States. However, more than 100 years after the Revolutionary War ended, England revealed Edward was actually a double spy selling America's secrets to the British. To this very day, Edward is considered to be one of the most successful double spies of the 1700s. The colonial James Bond. <laughs> yes, absolutely. However, it is thought that it's because of Edward Bancroft that Silas Dean was killed, oh. so, who was a, a revolutionary patriot. And unfortunately, we can't prove it. Yeah. So. Uh, Mistress, could you tell us the story about this little gravestone right in yes. front? Uh, thanks to the donations from past tours, we were able to restore this tabletop stone. There are five of these in the cemetery. All five are on the ground in rubble. We've had them all repaired. 
And when we lifted this stone up, which needed a crane because it was so heavy, we found this little stone underneath his, and it turns out it is Hannah, his granddaughter. So we were able to put her stone back up as well. So all of the money, all the proceeds from the tickets for these ghost tours go directly back into restoring our stones. So you are helping to yes, preserve history in Westfield. Let's give applause to ourselves. <laughs> Yay, and thank you. Mistress, how many, you said, are uh, the, the stones have you repaired through the years? Oh my, ah, that's a good question. We clean between 40 and 80 every year. We have two different cleaning dates. And as far as repairing, I, I can't, I don't know, but yeah. quite a few. Yes, yes. yeah. We, and the oldest stone in the, the uh, burying ground is whom? And how, how old is it? Her name was Abigail Noble, and her stone dates back to 1683. 16. Which you, when you think about it, that's just 60 years after the pilgrims arrived. And her stone is in beautiful condition. Um, and she died when she was, alas, only 20 years old in childhood. Oh, my word. Oh. Yes. How about the oldest person in the cemetery? We do have the oldest recorded age is 100 years old. And there's only one. Wow. Yeah. What was her name? Her name was Hannah Noble. Another Noble. Another Noble. Wow. Yeah. The Noble family got a road. <laughs> Everyone. Spirits of Westfield. Spirits of Westfield. Arise tonight. Arise tonight. And tell your tale. And tell your tale. When lit up bright. When lit up bright. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Thomas Ingersoll, and my claim to fame is I'm the son of John Ingersoll. John Ingersoll was granted land and the Little River by the good king back in 1666. But his real claim to fame was that he had 15 children. Yes, he had seven consecutive daughters, then yours truly, and then seven more after that. Talk about middle, middle child syndrome. <laughs> my brother died sadly during the Deerfield Indian skirmish, but my house was known as kind of a fortress that took in all the inhabitants and settlers. It was quite large. And during one night I returned home, my wife Sarah was there, and she was being scalped in the process of being scalped, believe it or not, by the great Indian warrior Chief Raylock. Fortunately for Sarah, I walked in the door just the right time, and I was able to fire around at the, at the chief, and his tale has never been heard since. Sadly, the fort burned down in 1900. That is my story. Thank you, sir. And an interesting story aside from this is your, your father's stone, the original settler, has been missing for years, sadly is gone. However, one of your descendants has given the money to have a new stone created in honor of your father. And Isn't that good of it? Yes, it will be put in in the end of October. So we are delighted with that story. And will it be right here? Actually, it will not. It will be, the Ingersolls go right across this area here, and he will be on the other side of it. I see. Yeah. We've got to congratulate you, sir, on your eight children. Oh, Indeed. my goodness. You might Indeed. want to give Indeed. people your secret out there. I'm not just going to tell you they were busy. There, you were very busy. Let's all do this together. <laughs> Once again, I think you've heard, you know what we're about to say. <laughs> Spirits of Westfield, arise, arise tonight, tonight and, and tell, tell your, your tale, tale when, when lit up bright. Quickly, right. wheel right, follow me. Oh. I apologize, good people. I, I don't often get visitors here. Um, and in fact, I sometimes forget I'm dead. Um, but thank you for coming. I'm Captain Isaac Phelps. Um, I was born in Windsor, down in the Connecticut colony. Um, and I came here to Warno, Westfield, along with my wife and Gaylord and my father, George Phelps, and many of my children, right over here in um, 1668, along with many of the other fine ghosts you've met this evening. I was granted land in the town and six acres in the meadow by the river, and I lived a strenuous but comfortable life as a gentleman farmer. I did serve my time in the militia from the age 16. I didn't miss a single training day or a single muster. In my youth, believe it or not, I was known 
as a fit man with the pike or the firelock or even the tomahawk. But as you can see, that was many years ago. During the alarm of King Philip, we were told to evacuate our homes and go to Springfield for safety, and we refused to do that. We stayed and we defended our homes while Springfield burned. At the age of 76, 76, mind you, the men of Westfield chose to elect me captain of the militia and awarded me this sword. And it is a distinction of which I'm enormously proud. But most people want to hear about my experience as the first real school teacher here in Westfield. Now, Reverend Taylor says he was the first school teacher because that was part of his minister job. But by 1702, he didn't want to do it anymore. So the city fathers announced that they were looking for someone to be a school teacher. However, they did stipulate that whoever they picked should not be a scholar. For some reason, they thought of me. Um, but for whatever reason, 15 years in the drafty school shed down behind the meeting house, I taught the young boys and young men of Westfield their lessons. I sent, prepared many for business, sent a few to New Haven, and many out to Harvard College. It was a very good life. I appreciate you coming by. Very few people visit anymore. I have this dream sometimes I think about while I'm sitting here, that if only like a, a distant relative, like say my ninth great grandson, were to like emulate me as a soldier and as a teacher, and to even come here and like tell stories about me, it would be great. But old men have silly dreams. I understand you are all going to see Reverend Taylor, and he does insist upon rectitude and promptness. So fare thee well this evening, my friends. Thank you, Thank you sir. And you might be just interested to know that this is the ninth great grandson, uh, who was not only a soldier, also, but a teacher as well. And still is a teacher. Isn't that amazing? Right. How many of you Sorry. went to university? and had the Norton Anthology of Literature. Is there anyone here? Oh, thank God, thank God. Well, in the Norton Anthology of Literature, you will find this person. He was the Poet Laureate of Colonial America, and his name is, well, let him tell you that. Let's bring him out with a rousing, spirited incantation. Spirits of Westfield, the rise tonight and tell your tale with lit up bright. bright. I am the Reverend Edward Taylor, and I am not one of the original 13 settlers, but I would come along soon enough. You see, Westfield was granted its charter in 1669 with the understanding that they had two years to find a charter or a minister. Now, does Westfield ever run out and do anything in time? <laughs> no, not Westfield. They would wait two years till 1671 when Thomas Dewey set out for Boston and found me. And there I was, 29 years old, having studied theology for three years at Harvard. I answered the call and we headed for Westfield, 100 miles through the dead of winter. Uphill both ways, snow up to our eyeballs. Very often we became lost. Does anybody know where we are? Just, yes, we're in Westfield. So we made it just fine. Arriving December 1st, crossing the frozen river, ice cracking beneath each footstep. I preached my very first sermon the next day. I went on to be not only minister, but teacher and physician for the town, guiding Westfield for 57 years until my death in 1729. Dad, please don't tell me you forgot about me again. Mahitable, my daughter! Indeed, I am Mahitable, one of Edward and Ruth's five daughters. Sometimes on gravestones, you will see the words consul or relic on women's stones. Did you know that often the first wife was referred to as the consul of her husband? If the second wife survived her husband, she'd be referred to as the relic of her husband. In 
and your mother Ruth survived me, which makes your mother a relic. But you survived your first mother. Doesn't that make you a relic? <laughs> well, who would like to hear a poem? Yeah. Yay! All right. Hold on to your britches, everyone. Here it goes. An address to the soul, occasioned by rain. Shall I be made a wildfire shop? Well, my door spare the fireball trade, do frisk and hop. And while the hammer doth the anvil pay. The fireball matter sparkles every way. One sorry fret, an anvil spark rose higher. And in thy temple falling, almost set the house on fire. Such fireballs dropping in the temple flame. Bonds up the building, Lord, if forbid the same. Thank you, Reverend. Spirits of Westfield, arise tonight and tell your tale when it all right. My name is Ezra Clapp. I was born in Northampton in 1760 and came to Westfield in 7th grade. I built a home at the corner of what is today Elm and Court Street. It was used as a tavern and meeting place for Westfield patriots during the Revolutionary War. It is said that the famous General Henry Knott stayed in our tavern while Holland recaptured English cannons from Fort Ticonderoga, New York, all the way to George Washington in Cambridge in 1776. I also fought as a patriot soldier in the Revolutionary War. In 1800, our tavern was purchased by Samuel Fowler, whose son later had it moved to its present location at 53 Court Street. We had six children, and I died in 1768 at the age of 51. Notice the epithet of my stone. All you that stand and view this stone, prepare for death as I have done. They were a cheery lot, weren't they? <laughs> Spirits of Westfield! Arise tonight and tell your tale when we are bright. You might come closer if you can. Well, did you know that for every small log cabin the settlers built, they used over 50 trees? Well, you've already heard about the two-mile fence around the early Westfield Fort. Well, that used over 5,000 trees. Fortunately, all the clearing of the land provided open uh, farmland uh, for the early farmers, which had it very difficult. The early farmers uh, could not grow much desired wheat due to the poor soil and short growing seasons. But the Native Americans introduced the settlers to three sisters of corn, beans, and squash. The corn provided a pole for the beans to grow on, and the beans grew up around the corn, providing stability in the wind and weather. Nitrogen from the beans helped fertilize the soil. Then at ground level, the squash crowded out the weeds and helped keep moisture in the soil. The mix provided a good balance of carbohydrates, protein, and vitamins. Uh, many country roads in the area passed by long stone walls seemingly in the middle of the woods. Well, all those stones were likely uh, dug up when the farmers were plowing their fields, showing how difficult it was. But over, after farming declined over 200 plus years, the trees started to reroot in all the unused farmland that we see today. Timber was one of the most important natural resources for the early settlers. All the lumber went to sawmills, uh, and then went to build shipyards, tanneries, warehouses, and other important industries in colonial Massachusetts. The settlers also traded in uh, beaver pelts and furs, maple syrup, horses, copper, beer, and rum. 
one of the early dietary staples uh, and still rooted in New England culture is Boston baked beans and brown bread. Brown bread was made of locally grown rye and made of cornmeal. Pea beans probably originated in Peru, but were by the 1600s were cultivated by the Native Americans in Massachusetts. Pigs supplying the pork had already been brought to the New World. Whoops! <laughs> New World by the early settlers. <laughs> and molasses uh, was made from sugar cane that was grown on plantations in the Caribbean. You want to hear some tree puns? Oh yes! yes. What did the tree do when the bank closed? What did the tree do when the bank closed? It started its own branch. <laughs> How do trees get online? How do trees get online? They just log in. <laughs> Can I ask you, ask you another question? Oh, bad, bad, bad. Where do young saplings go to learn? Where do young saplings go to learn? Elementary school. <laughs> and the last one to suffer through, what is the tree's least favorite month? What is the tree's least favorite month, sir? September! September! A nice round of applause. Let's all root for this tree. Thank you, sir. But don't encourage them more at this point. Now, as we walk here, I want you all to uh, know that you can see this bearing ground in the daylight. How do you do that, mistress? The key is available at the Westfield Athenaeum, and we strongly the encourage you to come back during the daylight. The Westfield Athenaeum. And if we wanted to join you in cleaning or, or helping the cemetery in any way, how do we do that? Yes, we have two cleanings, one in the spring and one in the fall, and it's usually advertised. Um, or perhaps we could call the Athenaeum. I'll have to ask them to make sure we can do that. But uh, we would love to have anyone come and join. Um, but we want to thank you so much for coming out tonight to hear our stories. Uh, there will be a donation jar as you leave. And if you feel moved, we would be happily, be, uh, be very happy to take your donations as all the money does come right back to repairing our stones. Yes, and, yeah. And uh, we will actually be having a work party next Saturday to do just that. I also want to give a big thank you to the police cadets. Two years ago, very sadly, we had a theft in here. All of the lighting equipment was stolen after oh, the ghost oh, tours, no. um, which was a tragedy. Our lighting guru, which is, who is Jay Pagluka, very generously agreed to come back again. In fact, he is the one who said he wanted to come back. So the police cadets are staying, camping overnight in our cemetery tonight to make sure that everything stays safe. A brave oh, no. walk they. Yes, yeah. so we are very pleased about that. Yes, and I'd like to thank the Westfield Commission, the Historic Commission, which is a department of the city of Westfield. And Mistress Gaylord is one of them, and they put on this wonderful event every year. They keep history alive in Westfield. And we can't thank you enough, Mr. Our you. pleasure. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you. As you leave, there'll be some ghosts right over here to say goodbye to you. So please wave goodbye. <laughs> we'll come out this way. Good night, everyone, and thank Good you night. for coming. Be safe, be healthy.